there are any children here, you are now invited to go to Children's Church if you would like. Feel free to head on over there. So I know you have probably seen them in a cartoon or maybe a sitcom. You've seen a little demon and a little angel sitting on the shoulders of some character that is facing a moral dilemma. You you watch as the character first listens to one and then the other as they make their case and their arguments for what the character should do seen this, right? It's a common and often a comedic plot device that shows the inner conflict of a character. Often the angel and the demon are that character dressed up. And these two make arguments, not just about what the character should do, but also about the why why a character should or shouldn't do something. And if you pay careful attention, you'll hear that especially the demon is concerned with this why. The angel is usually limited to an argument of doing something because it is the right thing to do. While the demon has plenty of arguments and excuses and alternative understanding for what is in the person's best interest about what they should do. We can relate to this trope because we know what we ought to do, and yet there are a million reasons and excuses why we don't do those things or we think we can't do those things and instead do what we want to do. So, Here is your interesting daily dose of early Christianity history for those fellow nerds out there. The origin of this common angel-demon convention is often traced back to this ancient book called The Shepherd of Hermas. Might be a Jeopardy question someday. Which was written sometime in the late 1st century or the early 2nd century, so we're talking early early Christianity, like first-generation Christianity. And sometimes this book is just referred to as the shepherd. And it was so valued by early Christians that many church leaders even considered it part of the biblical canon way back in this early time when the edges of the Bible were a little mushier than they are today. And it wasn't quite clear which books were in and were out. And this book, The Shepherd of Hermas, was actually hanging around the edges of the biblical canon at the same time the fate, the book of James, was up in the air. As we talked about when we first started looking at James, James was actually one of the last books to make the final cut. So while James made it into the final version, the shepherd kind of faded away. It fell into history, except for this one little blip, this one little section in which the writer describes how there are two angels within us, one of righteousness and the other of iniquity that direct our actions. And considering that James, that James's letter that we've been reading over the past couple weeks was circulating around the same time as the shepherd it's not surprising that we find these similar theme of good and evil in James. In the passage that we just heard this morning, the author outlines two kinds of wisdom. First, there's the wisdom that is earthbound. It is animal-like and demonic, according to the author of James, who then goes on to say that this kind of wisdom is fed by the bitterness of jealousy and it is fueled by self-seeking ambition. And if given sway, it produces arrogance and leads one to cover up the truth with lies. Here again, 
we find James's pointed remarks about the proclivities of human nature transcending time. We don't have to work very hard to imagine this kind of wisdom in our own context. We know it very well. We know what this earth-bound wisdom looks like because we see it at work all around us in individuals and groups and corporations and political parties that are all so focused on pursuing their own agenda to the detriment of anyone and anything that stands in their way. It's this kind of wisdom that covers up cruelty and makes excuses for inaction or dishonesty. This kind of demonic wisdom legitimizes corruption and circumvents the law, all while working hard to cover up its tracks and keep from being found out. In the words of James, it covers up the truth with lies. Fed by the insatiable need for more, more power, more money, more. This kind of wisdom feasts on that bitterness of jealousy that we harbor in our hearts, and it doesn't care who or what gets hurt in the process as long as it gets what it wants. And it's prone to that partiality and that favoritism that we discussed a few weeks ago. The theme of these two ways of being in the world has been present throughout the book of James. Like I said before, it's not hard to imagine what this wisdom looks like in our current context. I'm sure you can think of some concrete examples of this kind of wisdom at work in the world today. But as is the nature of James, as we've seen this theme throughout the rest of his letter, James gives us another way of looking at things, another way of being in the world. Because there's another kind of wisdom. A wisdom that comes from above, James says. And this kind of wisdom works for peace. It's kind and considered. It's full of compassion and it shows itself by doing good. It doesn't show partiality, but it practices peace. It's the kindness of a teacher, the sacrifice of a parent, the help offered to a stranger. Again, you can think of concrete examples of this kind of wisdom at work in the world. And it's this kind of wisdom that leads us to inhabit the world differently. It's a different orientation that's focused on the larger picture, what's good for everybody, not just what's good for me. This kind of wisdom tells a different story that runs counter to what the world would have us believe. A few weeks ago, we started our discussion with the story of Brian Peterson, who's an artist in California. Some of you may have remembered the video that we watched of his story. He began building relationships, and painting portraits of people in his community that were experiencing homelessness. And we saw not only how he was transformed, but the people that he painted, his neighbors, were transformed in the process as well. Because he was changing how they saw themselves. That's how we started this discussion of James. So it only seems fitting that we end our study on James this morning with the story of another artist whose piece, O Freedom, you see there on the screen behind me and on the cover of our worship bulletin. Some of you may have seen this painting if you went to the Art Institute a few weeks ago. They had a special exhibit on the work of Charles White in celebration of his 100th birthday. Charles was known for his powerful depictions of African-American history, culture, and lives. And he worked for over 40 years to tell a story that wasn't being told by the powers that be. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, 
Charles recounted how he couldn't define the differences he felt between himself and his white neighbors, let alone understand the reason for racism. But the fact of it was always there in the grotesque stereotypes and the limited opportunities and the absence of anyone that looked like him in the history books. He recalls spending many hours in the library while his mother was at work. And it was there that he discovered a different reality than the one that confronted him every day. As he read through the library shelves, he learned about the contributions of black Americans in every aspect of American history and culture and art and music. And he carried this knowledge with him until he couldn't keep quiet about it anymore. And he questioned his teachers, and he grew dissatisfied with their answers. So eventually he used this energy as he grew up and he developed his skill as an artist. He decided to tell a different story through his work. And as the exhibit at the Art Institute said, his work magnified the power and the beauty of the black figure through scale and form. His figures and his murals communicated universal human themes while focusing attention on the lives of African Americans and the struggle for equality. The note that I included on the back of the bulletin about his works includes the statement that he once made. It says, paint is the only weapon I have with which to fight what I resent. Charles used what was available to him, the gifts and the skills that he was given to tell a different story than the one that he was getting from the world around him, from his teachers and from the history books. He had eyes to see a different way of inhabiting the world, and he helped to sow the seeds that would make that vision become a reality. And that is the picture that James has been trying to paint for us, As part of the wisdom tradition, the letter of James is about sowing the seeds for us to envision an alternative way of inhabiting the world. One that honors the image of the divine that lives in everybody and dwells in every corner of creation. As we've made our way through James over the past few weeks, we've heard the instructions for righteous living. I don't know about you, but at times they have felt like just another burdensome list of do's and don'ts. But as a whole, James is not about trying to live that perfect Christian life. It's not about always getting it right and checking the right boxes. That's an impossible standard for anyone to live up to or to attain. Rather, James calls us to be curious about the world that we inhabit, and calls us to interrogate our own actions and to scrutinize our own motivations. It's about acknowledging that we carry a multitude of realities within us. And we have the power to choose which ones we bring to life, which ones we pursue with our words and our actions. Beyond the imperatives of James, The author has been holding up a mirror for us to see that we carry this duality within us. That we are both creatures of earth and we are bearers of God's image. Having having eaten from both the knowledge of good and evil, we bear the problematic fruits of that tree. But James ends the discussion of wisdom with a word on prayer that we heard just a little while ago that says the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask for it in prayer. And when you do ask and you don't get it, it's because you haven't prayed properly. You have prayed in order to indulge your own pleasures. Used within the spirit, the divine prayer is what keeps us centered. It has the power to keep us 
oriented towards the divine. But it's more than just this string of words that we put together on a Sunday morning or before we fall asleep at night. Prayer is more than the promises we make when our airplane hits some unexpected turbulence or when we want our respective sports team to win. Prayer is more than just words and empty promises. It's about pursuing that wisdom that comes from above and opening ourselves up to the presence of the divine in a multitude of ways. Through art and music, through our relationships. Live a life of prayer. Now I'll make a shameless plug for Sunday school. I haven't started reading it, I'll be honest. But it's The Revolutionary Power of the Lord's Prayer by Alice Green, who used to be a pastor here in the Chicago area. And I'm looking forward to seeing how she unpacks this beloved prayer of our tradition. Because prayer is this powerful way to anchor ourselves and to orient ourselves to the world. Mary Oliver wrote a poem. All good Baptist preachers have to throw in a poem every once in a while. It's been a while. So here's your poem for the day. Simply called prayer. And she calls us to just pay attention. Then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but a doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. Prayer opens us up. To hear the voice of a neighbor, the voice of a friend, the voice of our own hopes and dreams, the voice of creation itself, the voice of God, all bringing us a word of peace and encouragement. Beloved of God, we cannot attain a perfect life, but we can pursue a good one, a life in which we love our neighbor as ourselves, in which we sow the seeds of peace and harvest the fruits of love. Amen.